To paraphrase the old saying about the month of March, the 21st century, although still young, has come in like a lion. In its first 10 years, we've seen the global economy go from vibrant to dismal. As the new century began, we saw terrorism on America's shores and natural disasters such as hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, and tornadoes on a scale that taxes the memory for comparisons. While all this was going on, technology has blossomed. It has brought us new tools and a new vocabulary with words like Facebook and Twitter. Many recent changes have hit the transportation sector particularly hard. The economic downturn, for example, has left many highway agencies short on both funds to build projects and staff to manage them. Attacks on petroleum-based fuels, which has been the bedrock of funding for highway construction and maintenance, has already proven inadequate. And an even greater technological challenge to that funding approach is looming. Vehicles powered by renewable sources. And we've just seen the tip of the advances in this area. General Motors Director of Advanced Technology Vehicle Concepts, Christopher Baroni Bird, noted that today's cars and trucks are primarily mechanically driven, powered by internal combustion engines and energized by petroleum. In fact, they have essentially the same genetic makeup as automobiles pioneered over a century ago. In the book, Reinventing the Automobile, Dr. Baroni Bird with co-authors Larry Burns and the late Bill Mitchell describes how General Motors and other car manufacturers are moving toward a new automotive DNA, one that relies on newer technologies. For instance, electric-powered vehicles that are wirelessly interconnected to avoid crashes. He also noted these changes will continue to unfold over the next 30 years. The transformation is already underway. Late in 2010, Osamu Suzuki, the 80-year-old president of Suzuki Motors, warned Japanese automotive parts makers to start gearing up for the changeover to electric cars. With all the changes that the new century has brought us, a pertinent question is, are we trying to meet 21st century goals with 20th century organizations? Are we structured to respond to needs that no longer exist? And are we overlooking newer, more pressing needs? Have our staff and funding levels decreased to a point that demands figuring out how to work smarter? If the answers to these questions are yes, what do we need to do to change the way we do business? How do we adapt to the changes that have occurred already and be nimble enough to quickly shift practices or strategic directions as future changes occur? Several highway agencies and companies have already made substantial changes in their organizational structures and are reaping the benefits. They are now better able to anticipate, adapt, and react decisively to events in the business environment. Unfortunately, others have instituted changes with no real organizational commitment to change, and the result of that has been less than impressive. To understand the difference and to get some tips on how to create an organization for the 21st century, we need to take a look at what successful organizations are doing. Leaders of any of these organizations will tell you that the first step in transforming an organization is in recognizing that times are different. Yes, we've always had change, but the change we've seen recently is different, more all-encompassing. I've been in the highway business for going on 45 years, and uh, the last 10 years has seen more in the way of change uh, and innovation, uh, shifting gear, still not where we need to be, but an amazing change from the previous 30. Kassoff's observations are noteworthy because he has witnessed changes from both the public and private sector's perspectives. Prior to his current position, he spent decades heading a state transportation agency. Recognizing the magnitude of change is only the first step. The big question is, how can transportation organizations in both public and private sectors meet the unprecedented challenges of change? How can they thrive or even survive in such an environment? Thomas Sorrell speaks of the current environment as the new normal. 
I've been traveling around our state talking about the new normal and the circumstances we're in today and the impact it has on transportation. And I, I really like this phrase, the new normal. And if you look at recent economic and demographic events, it's really changed the outlook as far as we can see, and I really believe that. You look at the recession, this recession we've been in in this country is probably more severe than the past recessions, and it's been taking a little longer to recover from this. The yellow area in this illustration shows where we are today and that economic conditions are improving, but at a very gradual, slow pace compared to the recovery of past recessions. And in addition to economic realities, we must take into consideration emerging trends such as cultural, demographic, transportation, and technology shifts. Uncertainty about the economy has bled into many of the trends we are seeing in all of these areas. Maybe that is what Sorrell has termed the new normal, that our reality is determining the best way to do business in an environment of uncertainty. We have this new normal, and we need to acknowledge that in our business practices. Sorrell and the Minnesota DOT fit the role. How do Sorrell and his agency deal with the new normal? To determine sustainable solutions, the agency looks at how the three areas of society, economy, and environment come together. Under society, for example, they will study aspects such as equity, health, culture and history, accessibility, involvement, livability, and values. The sustainability umbrella, I think, really can prompt innovation and creative thinking when we think about sustainable solutions. The agency has undertaken extensive market research to understand which transportation-related factors align with Minnesotans' views of quality of life and whether or not those influencers are in alignment with Minnesota DOT's strategic direction study. One of the driving forces causing us to examine the way we do business is ever-decreasing funding. While much has been said about the need for a revised funding structure, the danger of outdated infrastructure, and the benefits of new technologies, the word doesn't seem to be getting out to the people who matter, the motoring public. Dr. Peter Ruane sees part of the problem as our industry's tendency to talk only to those inside the highway community. Ruane contends that to change, we need to change how people think about us. If we don't tell our story and share our successes, we will be defined by a public who do not support increased investment in transportation systems around this country. Take on the responsibility of, of telling the story that's out there that needs to be told. Because frankly, if we don't, if the, we have 10,000 people here, we have 6,000 member companies and individuals. If we don't, if we don't, no one else will. No one else is going to do this for you. Our challenge is to inculcate this, institutionalize this, and in everyone's responsibility going forward. Hal Kassoff agrees and noted that what got him into the highway industry was a Reader's Digest article that he read when he was 12 or 13 years old about the proposed interstate highway system. I talked about this system where you go coast to coast without a, a stoplight, and it was like, whoa. That is unbelievable. We have to figure out a way not just to be inspired, but to inspire others. Kassoff believes the idea of innovation within organizations needs to be ingrained into employees. It's a culture issue that needs to permeate vertically from the front office to the front lines and horizontally at all peer levels of an organization. We need to learn to be able to tell our story. Pete Ron was brought into the Missouri Department of Transportation in 2005 to institute change. Previously, he had headed New Mexico's Dynamic State Highway Program. The concept of performance management was something that I was very familiar with and having experienced the tremendous improvement in performance of an organization that's focused on what I call tangible results with real performance measures and then the accountability piece is so critical. Uh, but that model was something that I brought with me from New Mexico. Ron pointed to performance measures as the key to driving organizational change at MoDOT when he took over as head of the agency. 
Ron gathered all the managers for a strategic advance. During the first day, they hammered out a new mission statement and 17 value statements. The mission identified their direction, and value statements set their boundaries and playing field. The next day, they examined how Missouri DOT measures success. The result was 18 tangible results that became the driving force behind everything they do. Ron's list included things like uninterrupted traffic flow, smooth and unrestricted roads and bridges, and personal, fast, courteous, and understandable response to customer requests. Managers were then asked to identify measures that would give them the best indication whether or not they were delivering those tangible results. Ultimately, the agency came up with around 100 individual measures. Each quarter, the agency published the results of the measures and made them available both internally and externally to decision makers, partners, and the Missouri citizenry. Experts agree that a high level of communication with employees about proposed changes and the need for change is critical, and management needs to use all the tools available to them to get their message out. Lawmakers, uh, the governor's office, uh, the media, have all uh, provided extremely positive feedback regarding the accountability and transparency of MoDOT since implementing a performance management system. Uh, internally, uh, it's helped focus us as an organization. And so it's, there have been very positive responses from employees about the, the comfort that comes from understanding what your job is, and how you're going to be measured as to whether you're successful. Uh, the feedback uh, that I've received uh, through a number of instruments have been positive. And one of the issues of performance management is that you need to be surveying your customers, you need to be in survey, surveying your partners, you need to be surveying your employees. And so we have an annual survey of our employees. We have an annual survey of media. Uh, we have an annual survey of the general public, and you can track the improved performance of MoDOT since implementing performance management, along with the condition of our roads, the overall acceptance of the public, and now we have reached this point where 85% of Missourians are satisfied with MoDOT's performance. Often, we think of innovations as changes in themselves, rather than as the means of dealing with change. Faced with a backlog of projects demanding attention, there is an understandable resistance to taking time out, even if it is to learn about a better, faster, less costly, and often safer way of completing projects. To Victor Mendez, innovation is the very key to dealing with change. Like Sorel, Kassoff, Ruane, and Ron, Mendez has been a leader in more than one highway arena. Prior to joining the federal government in July 2009, he served as director of the Arizona Department of Transportation. Our success will hinge on how creative and innovative we can become. In the industry, you know, we have been very successful doing what we do. Uh, we have been very successful in, in building our infrastructure. Uh, but, but I think to really be even more successful, we're going to have to find other ways of delivering to the American people. FHWA's focused effort on innovation began in 2003 when industry consensus grew around the concept of faster project delivery. FHWA at that point created Highways for Life. Under the program, we pioneered some ways of doing business that are now standard within FHWA and the industry. At FHWA, we have been very focused on becoming a culture of, of innovation. We're changing how we move new ideas through our, throughout our entire agency and to get them out to the state and local transportation in agencies, to the pub, pr public and private sector. You know, we, we deal with all levels of government. Uh, within FHWA, we created teams around specific technologies, a, a training program that we call LEAP, not CREEP. And, and that was intended to uh, help us uh, develop deployment plans and, and identify how we would deploy grants for projects that put certain technologies out into the field in, in actual practice. It's been you know, about eight years, and at that time it, it was a, a really good step in the right direction.
Shortly after becoming administrator of the agency, Mendez gave the employees a challenge. Now, one of my priorities was, was to shorten project delivery time. Uh, general consensus out there is that uh, major projects take about 13 years. I established a goal for all of us to figure out how, how can we uh, reduce project delivery time by 50 percent. As you might expect, uh, a lot of people immediately said, hmm, that can't be done. But uh, I think you know, my, my persistence and insistence on looking at how to get there, and maybe we don't get to 50 percent, that's still my goal, but we have to look at it. We can't just say it can't be done. As a vehicle to his goal, Mendez established Every Day Counts, an initiative with two business goals, to shorten project delivery and to speed up deployment of innovation and technology. So really, when you think about Every Day Counts, it, it really is sort of a uh, part of a, the playbook from Highways for Life. Um, it's kind of an extension of Highways for Life, looking at innovation. Uh, we have created distinct teams to manage each specific initiative. And we, we really have actually put a lot of our internal key people through the uh, program, the, the, the training program I mentioned earlier, Leap Do Not Creep, so that we can continue to focus on deploying technology faster. In addition, the agency initiated a series of 10 regional summits throughout the country to explain what the initiative is all about. The intent of the summits was to bring the critical stakeholders to the table people at the front lines that actually have to deliver projects, that actually have to deploy technologies and new ideas. The summit concept for explaining innovations is a new paradigm for FHWA. In addition to engaging frontline workers, the summits also got the attention of leaders in the highway community in every state. But those summits were just the beginning. FHWA is realizing that its role goes beyond simply providing funding for the federal highway program. Um, since the summits, uh, we then have engaged our individual offices. Uh, in case you're not aware, FHWA has an office in every individual state. And so, plus we have one in, in D.C. and one in Puerto Rico, so we actually have 52 offices. And, and so through that um, structure, uh, what we uh, are now doing as a next step is we're asking our individual we, division administrators to work individually with the states and the stakeholders that came to the summits to create a state-specific implementation plan. And again, you know, it's important for all of us to keep in mind something that I feel very strongly about and probably because of my background coming from a state, that uh, it's important for us to um, not think that everything needs to be driven from Washington, D.C. We, we want the Federal Highway Administrator to be known as brokers of knowledge, not just brokers of money. So, um, you know, obviously having money is important, you know, bringing money to the table is very important to all of us, but uh, we believe we can add more value when we bring new ideas and knowledge to the table as well. As the Federal Highway Administration staff works with state and local agencies and the private sector to get innovations adopted, Mendez points to a new mindset that he's encouraging FHWA employees to adopt. And we call that new way of thinking leaning forward. Leaning forward is like being a waiter who not only presents a menu but actively makes recommendations. It's different than when we sit back and wait for someone to ask the right question. So our leaning forward posture is to be at the table with new ideas, new suggestions. Of course, when there are many, many innovations coming at an agency at once, it's difficult to know how to deal with them all, especially when trying to do that within an existing system built for another time. Minnesota's Sorrell recognizes the challenge and refers to it as closing the gap between policy and technology. We have a, a lot of innovation, a lot of technology that exists. We know it's there, we know we can use it, we know it can be effective. Sometimes the policy uh, is lagging behind the technology and uh, somehow I think we've got to figure out how to close that gap and not only in, at the state level but at the federal and national level as well. Are we really doing all we can to remove those barriers to facilitate the use of new technologies? That is the challenge that faces every individual and every organization within the highway community. It's not going to be easy, and every organization will be different. 
But trying new ideas and sharing them will be the only way to deal with the world as it is today. As President Barack Obama noted in his State of the Union address in January 2011, the future is ours to win. But to get there, we can't just stand still. So, in these changing times, we need to take some hints from what others are doing in effectively managing our organizations. For more information on what some of these successful organizations are doing, peruse the Highways for Life website. For more information about innovations that shorten project delivery, enhance the safety of our roadways, and protect the environment, visit the Everyday Counts website.